is, um, it is really just such a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. Thank you for having me um, for this discussion or this conversation about serendipity. And since this happened, and um, you know, since we had this first conversation, I've been doing a lot of thinking about serendipity. And Mondi, I have to say, you sounded like you were the entire faculty senate, you know, <laughs> when we were doing the screaming and the yelling and the cheering and the ups and the downs. Um, higher education is a dynamic place, so thank you for getting us going. But I was thinking about this and thinking about what serendipity means and what it means to all of us. And you know, some of you may have also done that history, that looking back. Um, and I really appreciate uh, the setup and talking about what serendipity means. And it's so great to be here with our partners um, here at the CCCD and in Asheville. And some of you probably know, you know, a little historian, uh, that it, uh, serendipity has its roots back in 1754, when legend has it that an aristocrat author by the name of Horace Walpole apparently was reading a Persian fairy tale called The Three Princes of Serendip. And he wrote to a friend, as one would when you're reading The Three Princes of Serendip, that the princes were always making discoveries by happenstance and by getting lost along the way and by using their wisdom to find out where they were going. And that they weren't necessarily uh, knowing where they were going, but they were sort of on a quest. So I started thinking, imagine how different that would be in the 21st century. And I was thinking, um, set aside for a moment the stereotype about these three guys, these three, three princes, not willing to pull over and ask for directions, you know, that they're all getting lost. So that was my first thought. The second was now with GPS, it would be a little bit more challenging to get lost because you can just plug in the coordinates and figure out where you're going. And then I thought, imagine if, um, if Horace had not penned his letter but instead, he sent a text message. And I thought that, you know, I imagined all these little emojis, a couple of camels, maybe some lanterns, <laughs> some flying carpets, road signs. And then I thought there'd be all these little smiley faces, shrugging and winking. And I thought somehow it just wouldn't have been the same. And I do think that that's where communication becomes so important. The other thing I thought it might be interesting is because you're all so gracious to be here on the Friday entering into a long weekend, and some of you might be gathering for uh, cookouts and barbecues, and, and I thought you might want to know, just in case the party gets slow, that in 1754, that was the first year, much like Ser the Princes of Serendip, that was the first year that a political cartoon was published, and it was created by Ben Franklin. So just in case you thought the only important thing that happened in 1754 was the coining of the word serendipity, I want you to know there was something else that happened as well. So tuck that away if your weekend gets a little slow. Um, <laughs> You know, I've been in those places, and it's like you can pull it out and say, did you know Ben Franklin uh, did a certain, It just changes the whole conversation. It's remarkable what can happen. So thinking about the origin of the world and the connection to a fairy tale, there's no wonder that folks might think that there's this magic, there's this mysticism, there's this myth attached with serendipity, that it's something that just sort of someone taps you on the shoulder and, and all kinds of magical, wonderful things occur. So then when I think about that, I happen to be a baseball fan, and I think about Theo Epstein, and I think about what he's done with the Red Sox and the Cubs, and taking these two teams that had long droughts and turning them into championship seasons. So I think at some point there's going to be a lot written about Theo, and there'll be a lot to talk about baseball. So I'm not going to talk about baseball today. We'll save that for another day. But there's something where a little bit of magic, a lot of luck, and getting some good pitchers can make all the difference in the world. <laughs> or think about Katherine Johnson. Um, now, Katherine Johnson, uh, you, how many of you have read the book Hidden Figures or seen the movie Hidden Figures? So Katherine Johnson, when she was tapped on the shoulder to, in the flight research division as a computer, because that's what they were called, to be assigned to the group that didn't even know yet what they were going to be working on, she would say later when she was interviewed that that was luck. But the author of the book, Margot Lee Shetterly, said that it wasn't just simple luck. It was about bringing together a prepared mind and an opportunity to work on the unexpected, to work on creativity, to work at this intersection of science and creativity. And that it comes from being in a position to seize that opportunity, that it's the happy marriage of time, place, and chance. So imagine to be working in that moment, in that time, and being able to be one of the people that helped send John Glenn into space. Probably not luck, a lot more was at play there. And I would add to the well-trained mind that they speak of that it's also about a curious mind. 
It's about a creative mind. It's about a mind that takes an information and stretches it and pulls it apart and works beyond boundaries, that processes it, reprocesses it, and thinks through again what have we just learned and compares it to other pieces of information. And that sounds to me like a mind that benefits, has been part of a liberal arts education. And for me, I have an incredible bias about a liberal arts education. <laughs> One would hope being the chancellor of a liberal arts university. So when we think about the work that we do at UNC Asheville, where we get to open minds, and we think about the words of someone like Steve Jobs who talks about the intersections of technology and creativity, and that when one thinks about a project as sophisticated as the iPhone, that what it has to be is the blending of technology and the aesthetic to make it appealing, to make it work. That's the intersection, that's the liberal arts. Or when we think about the words of a great genius, I almost, when I was putting this together, I, I was gonna take out scientists and just put mad genius. Um, but I thought scientists was more respectful. But when you think about what a liberal arts education does for the mind, what it does to free the mind, what it does to engage, what we do every day at UNC Asheville, as Brent said, your public liberal arts university. We're the designated public liberal arts university for the state of North Carolina, one of 37 such institutions in the country. Very proud of that designation. And at our campus, thank you. Um, uh, all right. <laughs> um, way to go. Um, we'll, and, but it is true. And when we think about that, um, it's the public liberal arts. It's the public liberal arts because liberal arts should not be exclusive to those who can afford it. It should be available to all who need it. And I would argue it is many of us who need it. I'm the product of a public liberal arts education myself. I'm one of six kids. My dad was an auto mechanic. We didn't know what a college president was or a chancellor. In fact, when I hear people call, saying Chancellor Grant, I think that's my first name. And, <laughs> and it's not. Um, and at least not my given name. Um, so it's about when we do that work, we do it in teams, we do it as a community, we do it with curiosity, we do it with integrity. And when I think about the work that we do at UNC Asheville, the way we bring what we learn in the classroom, what this incredible faculty do every day, some of whom are in this room, and they bring it to life, whether it's through our farm to table dinners where we break bread and we gather and we get to know one another and we work with the sustainable movement and the farmers in the area, or our B hotels, which are partnerships with the Asheville Design Center, or our entrepreneurs who are working with students on a kernel of an idea that then takes them from Asheville to Raleigh to Beijing powerful stuff, or I think about what's happening in our STEAM studio in the River Arts District, where our incredible faculty working in partnership with students are making places for creative collisions to occur. That's the best part of a liberal arts education. That's where we do our best work. So in addition to the prepared mind, which is important, the trained mind, which is important, not a rigid mind, that doesn't help us. It's the open mind. It's the, it's the mind that is open to serendipity. It is the mind that says we have to be willing to continue to learn, to listen, to really listen, and to go deep in that listening. Not to just that casual listening, but where you are engaged with somebody else, where you are hearing what they say, and you're sharing that space, and you're glad that you are there. So, <clears throat> so here I am in, this, in Asheville sharing this space with all of you this morning, and I think about how I got here. And I think about where I was before coming here, and I was in the Berkshires, another beautifully creative part of the world. And as I like to say to folks, I just started walking down the Appalachian Trail, and look at where I ended up <laughs> in Asheville. It was a long walk, I'm telling you that. But I thought I would share with you as part of how um, I've seen in my own life serendipity make its presence known. And then most importantly, serendipity, I think, is an action verb. It's what you do with it, because if it just lands on your shoulder and you sort of look the other way, the moment has passed and, and you lose that opportunity. So two examples, <clears throat> which kind of speaks to the way that I lead and, and work with such incredible people every day and the students that we work with most importantly. So when I began as a college president at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in North Adams, Massachusetts in the Berkshires, an industrial town that the manufacturing base had gone away from, so I was a brand new president. I, did, I, I think at that point I was one of the youngest college presidents in the country. The world has moved on. I'm no longer the youngest college president in the country. Um, maybe a little bit more seasoned, a little bit more bitter, and a little bit more hardened, but experienced. Um, that comes with age. That comes with age. Those are the creative collisions, and we survived them, God willing. 
<laughs> so as I began my presidency, um, it was the one year anniversary of 9-11. So a year had passed since that moment that, um, that is really still defining us today. And so to work in partnership with our city, we thought what we should do was gather folks, walk up to the campus, walk to the college, and have a shared experience together to remember, to never forget, to reflect and build community. So I was walking up Church Street in North Adams, and I happened to be walking with a group of eight or 10-year-old girls. I pick out the kids first. The 40-year-olds can take care of themselves. The kids are just so much more interesting. And so as we're, isn't that true? <laughs> um, um, so we're walking along, and these little girls start looking around, and they say, is this the college? Are we at the college? And in that moment, in that moment, the way I would be a college president changed. I don't know that I was presently aware of it in that moment, but the fact that these two young girls who were growing up in the shadow of this college did not know that was the college, to me what it said was what an opportunity we have. To me it said what work we have to do to connect this institution with its community and most importantly with our future. So we began the work of the university of connecting it with its community. We began work to make sure that every kid in the region would know that this place was for him or her, that we wanted them to know education was in their future. We were in a part of the state that had the lowest median household income in the state of Massachusetts. So we had lots of families for whom education was not something they talked about, let alone a liberal arts education because that was not what these kids were expected to do. So we began that work, and one of the greatest things that we did was opening the campus community up. And we started with ninth graders, bring them on. We started with sixth graders, bring them on. Great energy. Then we said, let's get the third graders. Let's get those kids when they're just little and bring them onto campus. And we did that, and it was great fun. And you bring third graders into a chemistry lab, and you let them blow something up, it is powerful. It is powerful. So we would see these kids come in, and we would let them transform something that was maybe dust and I'm not a chemist, you can tell, dust and water. You put them together. <laughs> I think it's more than that. <laughs> I'm imagining something on the periodic table, I'm guessing. And then it would blow up. And what we would see on the looks of these kids was inspiration, curiosity, a little madness. <laughs> and I would say, we are enlightening. We are bringing in the next generation of creatives, of scientists, maybe a few sociopaths. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I decided it was worth that risk. It was worth that gamble because we had to spark that passion and we wanted every kid to know this was their place. We set a goal for the entire region that lifelong learning should be the standard, not the exception, and that we would be the place that would lead that and that's the work that began the pres my first presidency and it was a gift and an honor and a gift and an honor years later when I would be with some of those kids and I'd say to them, for how many of you is this the first time you've ever been on a college campus? And over time, fewer hands would go up. Over time, fewer hands would go up. That's a creative collision. That's when you take your university and you bring it into the community and you take the walls real or perceived and you bring them down. When you introduce those bright young minds to your incredibly talented faculty and to students that are there, that's when you have your creative collisions. So the second story I'll share with you about an impact and one that again led to the way I think about how we do our work was I was at the University of Massachusetts and I was a senior fellow at the McCormick Institute, now the McCormick Graduate School, and I was part of the team that created UMass Online that gave birth to the distance education arm of the university. And as part of the McCormick Institute, we were going to, to West Africa, to Senegal, where we were involved in a partnership with a university that was really looking at how to connect with the villages that surrounded it. My job was to do some work in the village, but really my biggest job was to give a lecture on distance education to the faculty and the students of this university. I said, fine, that's easy, I can do that. We spent two days working in the village, which was powerful. We were so, so well treated and welcomed with love and, and just embraced by this community. We met with village elders, we met with the women who were trying to set up small microeconomic systems, whether it was having um, a chicken coop where they could take the eggs and sell them, or creating huts to do the dyeing of the beautiful fabrics one sees in West Africa and other parts of the continent. So great work in this community, engaging, breaking bread, doing what you do. So on the day of my lecture, I left the village, which was right across the street 
It was like walking from one side of this room to the next. And my husband came with me, who's a community organizer and was doing community work with us in the village. And we're making sure everything worked, because you know how with technology, you want to make sure it works because it doesn't when you're in front of a room. So we're in there and we're getting it ready, and everything's go, making sure that when I was giving this lecture with the faculty and staff of this university, I would be able to show them all of what we were doing back in the States, because there was a lot of work happening in Africa connecting people through distance education, and we were going to do the same. Around 5 o'clock, which was the time of my lecture, nobody was there. Getting a little anxious, um, but you know, a little after five, a faculty member sticks his head in and he says, don't worry, um, people run a little late. I'm fine with that, gave me a little bit more time. About 15 minutes later, I hear noise in the hallway, and the faculty member sticks his head in again, and they begin to bring more chairs into the classroom. And I'm thinking, what in the world was going on? Well, what in the world was going on was that almost every member of the village had come across the street to come to my lecture. Every member of the village, I'm talking elders, women carrying children, people coming into the room, they're pulling in more chairs. And pretty soon I'm looking at this room and I use the academic term, I'm screwed. <laughs> it's an academic term. Because now I realize that all my preparation in giving a lecture on distance education was for naught. Because I just figured, okay, this is an interesting situation. This was a creative collision of the first magnitude. So the good thing about taking time to set up all those chairs and with people coming in with babies and children was that I had a couple of minutes to think on my feet. Being a good liberal arts student, that's very helpful. And so as I stood there and I began to speak, and what was also a complicating factor was initially I would be giving my lecture and it would be translated into French, which was fine because Francophone West Africa, that was the primary language of the faculty and the staff, so I was good. My French was a little rusty. I had a colleague who would be translating. The kicker was nobody in the village really spoke French. Their native language is Wolof. I don't know about you, but my Wolof is very, very <laughs> rusty, very rusty. So fortunately, we had another teammate who spoke well off. That was great. Always travel with the team. Again, the power of the liberal arts. Bring people who see the world, understand the world differently. So I began my lecture, and I would say a few things like, welcome, and here's how we're using technology for education. That would be translated into French, brief, succinct. I understood what was being said. And then it would be translated into Wolof. And it reminded me a little bit of Mondi's presentation because it's a storytelling language. Their words don't translate neatly. And so it would go on for several minutes and people would start to laugh. And I thought, I didn't say anything funny and I didn't speak that long. <laughs> I was being tested. And so it would come back up. And so we got through it somehow. And because one of the things I realized I needed to do was to talk about the technology, was to use that moment of education, but to change the content, to talk about technology as a tool for linking us, for bridging communities, for building bridges to the distance, and not in the same way I would have had it been a room full of faculty. Got through the lecture, the lecture wrapped up, and at the end of it, everybody who had come from the village came to the front of the room, shook my hand, and the last person in line was one of the village elders, a woman who took my hand in both of hers and looked at me right in the eyes and said clearly so I could understand it, you are our sister. You are our sister. So I thought to myself, wow, how did this kid from Dorchester, Massachusetts, whose dad was an auto mechanic, end up in this place in this country in the front of the room making these connections with people that I never even knew existed a few months ago? And the power of that interaction was not about the power of the technology, but the power of being present, of making those connections, of really being in that place, of listening, of learning, of being open to the opportunity that presented itself. And the gift that was given to me to say, technology is what we turn on, but what's important for engagement is that human connection, is that way of being together, of having that creative collision, of realizing that there's more in common with each other than we have not. That was very powerful, transformational, a moment of serendipity that changed again the way I think about the work that I do. Never underestimate who's in the room. Never be disinterested because they're not the people that are supposed to be there. They're the exact people that are supposed to be there. That's serendipity. Connecting with those individuals, learning from them, engaging with them, being with them, that's serendipity. What you do with it is serendipity. So it was just an incredibly powerful experience to have that be the pivot, to have that be the moment, to have that be the learning. Because the tools of technology change 
all the time, quickly. It's the power of those relationships that stay and sustain us and bring us forward. So those were just experiences in terms of how I, I, was, I was so glad to be present. And so as I think about the time of year we just went through on our college campus, commencement, where we turn an incredibly talented group of graduates into the wider world and hope that they will do their best work, and I know that they are well prepared because I know the folks they work with every day. I have the opportunity every year to look at those graduates and I give them a charge as they're heading out. Frankly, they really have no other choice because they have to sit and listen. I'm the last thing between them and turning the tassels. And, <laughs> and so it's really, it's a great, it's a captive audience. It's, you know, it's one of those times when we say, and you, two years ago when you did that, but you don't call people out at graduation, you speak broadly. But what I say to my graduates and what I'd say to all of us here this morning is I encourage them to take what they've learned from their liberal arts education, take the very best parts of it. Take the parts that create the connections, that build community, carry that forward into the world as they go about their business. That is so important to do. Draw upon the very best parts of your education. Know that you have learned and that you've learned deeply. Listen to other ideas. Your way of thinking may not be the best way of thinking. And get out into the world to learn and listen and gain empathy from the people whose lives you want to improve. And one book I would recommend to all of you, because as a good academic, I should recommend a book as we're wrapping up, is I've been reading Thomas Friedman's new book, Thank You for Being Late. And it really is a memoir. And it looks at his trajectory from where he grew up to what he did in the middle to going home again. And he says this, it is so much easier to venture far, not just in distance, but also in terms of your willingness to experiment, take risks, and reach out to each other when you know that you are tethered to a place called home and to a real community. And I would say here in Asheville, we are tethered to a real community. We have these opportunities to come together. These opportunities are not luck. These opportunities are deliberate. They're active. These opportunities allow us to have serendipity. Thank you. <laughs>